Great. Um, fabulous talks. So the data is really compelling and there's a lot of it. Uh, and yet we're stuck in terms of dietary guidelines and clinical guidelines. And it's really difficult to, to move that dial when you're in medicine and, and, and really abutting against some of these, these guidelines. I guess I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. How can, we, how can we move the dial when we've got such big, powerful, bodies that are that are stuck despite all the evidence uh, question. I don't know you know when when we started using a low carb diet in, in our practice back in the mid 1980s we saw results that all of you have experienced that uh, were just almost magical I mean you couldn't believe that you were seeing what you were seeing in terms of, of all kinds of health improvements. And I thought, you know, all we've got to do is write a book and get it out about this and the whole world will change. And <laughs> we wrote one about our experiences in 1995 and it still hasn't changed. So what was that? Let's see, that's 95, that's 27 or 28 years ago. And so I don't know what it's going to take, but you know, you have meetings like this now, which we didn't have back then. And I remember giving a talk at Colorado State University, and I was putting up kind of some primitive-looking slides. And the and this was back in the day, you know, when you had to do your slides and take pictures of them, and they were in a carousel. And I was doing this to this audience full of people, and this was right at the height of the low-fat frenzy. Um, and the uh, and somebody asked, "What? Well, what's the fat percentage of the diet that you're using?" And I never really thought about it in terms of percentages. And so I really quickly did the percentages in my head. And I said, well, it's probably, you know, 65 or 70% fat. And, you know, you could just hear this collective <gasps> from the entire audience. And, and that was the first time I had thought of that. But, I, you know, it's been 28 years now. And we're having meetings like this that are filled with people that know it. And, you know, I speak in meetings in the U.S. and, and they're, a number of low-carb groups around, so I think we're making incremental progress, but it's, I would never have dreamed that it would have taken this long, given the outcome that you have with, with patients with the diet. So for me, it's basically uh, helping one person at a time. So when that person is in my consultation room, I'm in charge, and I'm going to give that patient, that person, the best available advice for them to help improve their health. Um, so I just ignore whatever guidelines are out there if it doesn't make sense to me. And I help the person understand why they too need to ignore the advice based on the data that I show them. So, yeah, I mean, I think uh, waiting for the guidelines to change, you know, we, we've been hoping for that to change. And it's just changing perhaps at a snail's pace. So for me, it's that one person in my room. Um. As an agronomist, let me just offer the observation that the last three editions of the Dietary Guidelines in America have contained a, a line, something along the lines of, not intended for the treatment of disease. Now, my understanding is what they're saying is, eat this way, you won't get sick, but if you get sick, don't eat this way. <laughs> so, okay, fine. That's now, what, 93% of Americans, adults, don't have optimal cardiometabolic health. So for most people, the dietary guidelines are no longer fit for purpose. Um, I, I like the long march through the individuals um, as, <laughs> as an approach. We have people who are trying to affect change in the dietary guidelines, and God bless them. Um, I'm going to work at the, you should pardon the expression, grassroots level. and. Um, <laughs> And I'm encouraged by the idea that a tipping point can be as little as 20%. And so if we keep multiplying the personal experiences, then we'll find all kinds of forces liberated that we can't understand right now. Yeah, and I'll um, totally agree that it, I think it's a revolution from below. My bias being a GP is that I think GPs are essential to this process and uh, are supporting you people who are out there doing this, um, one person at a time and ignore the guidelines and invent our own. 
Uh, thanks for some great speeches. Um, I just wanted to ask, in terms of ancestral diets, um, obviously, apart from the ones that died out from being vegetarian, they did eat a lot of meat. But what was their lifespan? Because I often say to people, you know, look at what our ancestors ate, and they say, yeah, but they all died young. And apart from, you know, if you get rid of the infant mortality, I'm just wondering if you know, you know, what the lifespan actually was and if we can compare that to today. Um. Yeah, in a way, I mean, Stephen Austad is a longevity or a, an anti-aging guy, and he's gone back and looked at a lot of this. And what you look at is the mortality rate doubling figure. In other words, how, how long does it take you to double your mortality rate? And when he looked at all that, uh, in other words, how many years is it if you're 50 years old, how many years do you have to live before your odds of dying are double what they are at 50 years old? And in modern humans today, I think it's about 11.2 years is the mortality doubling rate. And when he looked at, uh, because there's a lot of data out there, there are a lot of skeletons that they can age in, you know, in these ancient societies. I mean, sometimes hundreds of them are, are unearthed in you know, one little village. And so they can age them and do this. And so he calculated that the, uh, the mortality rate doubling or the, the the doubling of the mortality rate in ancient people was probably somewhere around eight or nine. So it's not really that much different. It's a little bit different, but not that much different. And when you, and, and they didn't age, it's not like, you know, you see, okay, the average age at death is 42. They don't look like Methuselah at age 42. They don't age like that, but they were much more prone to accidental deaths, to infectious, you know, deaths from infectious diseases. They were all riddled with parasites. Um, so there were a lot of problems like that that brought them down earlier that didn't really have anything to do with, with diet. And I think also the infant mortality skews the figure, so you need to take uh, some baseline after infancy to, to look at the total. And of course, we're now trending downward. So. There is a concept, the modal age of death, um, I wish I could define that more. Perhaps someone in the audience or on the panel knows about the modal age of death. But my understanding is that in hunter-gatherers, it's 70, that there's a peak in of death and child mortality. But actually, if you survive childhood, you're quite likely mm. to live to an older age, which is not too different from uh, current life expectancies. You know, they found in the data you know, Neanderthals that were in their 60s and ancient humans that are, you know, homo sapiens that are in their 60s and they even say sometimes in their 70s. So it wasn't unheard of for people to live a long time if they avoided getting killed, you know, if they avoided trauma, <laughs> freezing to death, starving to death, all the things that could befall ancient man. This question is for uh, Dr. Ballastad. I didn't really grasp this concept of crude protein. Could you explain that again, please? Sure, so crude protein is a metric that's been used to estimate feed or food value. And it's a math, it's a, the product of multiplying the measured percent nitrogen by a factor of 6.25, based on the assumption that all the nitrogen that was in that feed or food sample was in protein, and that all that protein was 16% nitrogen. Well, and, and ruminants can utilize non-protein nitrogen. Humans, other simple stomached animals, monogastrics like swine and poultry and, and, and fish can't. And so for almost half a century now, swine nutritionists have been balancing their rations, diets, sorry, rations, <laughs> on an individual indispensable amino acid basis. And interestingly enough, there's an environmental impact if they get that out of balance because then you could end up with greater nitrogen excretion if you're not providing sufficient essential amino acids. So they're keen to that as well as profit and all those things. So we've been using 
crude protein as part of the proximate analysis system since about the 1880s. And it's been tweaked over the years, but it's basically the same thing. We do a Keldahl analysis of the sample, determine the percent nitrogen, multiply it by 6.25, and that's the value that's then listed on a label or in a table. And it bears a weak association to the true protein content of the feed, and then we need greater sophistication because of the amino acid composition issues. Thank you. Agriculture question for Dr. Balistrone here. Um, I studied and um, work in agriculture, and there's not a week that goes past where I don't hear something about uh, methane emissions from animals. You know, farmers are being driven to get their carbon footprint lower, and the current uh, piece that I, um, I see with a, a big question mark over it is the use of seaweed as a, as a means to reduce methane, which is a natural process that ruminants use. What impact is this like to have on our food? Well, yeah, so great question. Uh, one, I don't think it's been labeled yet for food producing animals, right? I mean, they've demonstrated it, but they haven't said you can use it in a dairy and then sell the milk, right? So there's that question. Uh, number two, it's, prob it's primarily going to be dairy um, because most of the cattle are free ranging and you have to give this stuff at least once a day, if not more. And so how do you do that with animals that are out on pasture primarily? Um, number three is the dairy really isn't the issue from the animal's perspective because they're getting a very high quality ration, which re results in lower emissions. Right, so, so all, yes, it can work, but dot, dot, dot. Um, there was a paper that came out earlier this year um, that demonstrated that you can have comparable greenhouse gas emissions from savannas dominated by wildlife or livestock. So you have similar emissions from both. Now, grassland has to be grazed or burnt. I'd rather graze it either by wildlife or livestock. And so we've had this kind of artificial conversation where we're comparing livestock emissions to some zero emission scenario that doesn't exist. So, and, and then the bit about the GWP star is methane that's emitted by a grazing animal is from the CO2 that was fixed via photosynthesis to produce dry matter that the cow eats, and then she belches some small percentage of that back to the atmosphere, where in 10 years it's oxidized to CO2 again. So it's a cycling of CO2, therefore no new, in quote, CO2 entering the atmosphere, as opposed to fossil fuel use, which represents an increase in the old CO2. Okay, good, thank you. I, <laughs> my brother. <laughs> Should I start with a backstory? <laughs> um, fantastic talks and amazing information. And I guess I'm here for the layperson who, who, who probably, you know, they're at a party and they are eating their meat and someone says, oh, my God, you're going to kill yourself and the planet. And we can't really explain in such terms as what you've done today. Amazing talks. In your words, what would be one simple paragraph to respond to this person to help open them up a little bit? Like what would you say to someone who said that to you at a party? Uh, I get that a lot. Uh, <laughs> Because when I'm at a party, I have doctor friends who are saying I'm eating too much meat, too much salt. Mm. Uh, so, and I ask them, I just ask them. So, it, it, we have to be careful in how we, we, we question them because we don't want them to make them feel stupid. And, and that's what pisses people off. So, um, it's inviting them to think like us. So, it says, why do you say that? Right. And then I ask them, so when they quote, their source. I will ask them to go and look at the source and tell them how to dissect the information they've received. 
right? And that's when they will realize that the source which they were quoting is actually, uh, you know, without any merit. I get this a lot from patients who are vegetarians or vegans because um, they are unhealthy and I'm gonna tell them to uh, have some animal-based proteins in their diet and they would say, oh, it's harmful to the environment. So I will ask them to go and watch this movie called The Sacred Cow and say, okay, go look at that documentary first and then decide and then, and then think if, if it's still uh, damaging to the environment. So it, it, I don't confront them and saying, ah, it's that oh, global warming, ah, it's fake. If you say it's just fake, oh, it, it, they're not going to think and, and, and they're going to look at you as a climate change denier. Right? Asking them to go and look at the evidence, I think that's what's um, helpful and helps people start thinking. So that's never happened to me. <laughs> But if it were to happen to me, so um, I, I, I've been quite taken by the idea that if you make a statement, you've established something to be defended or attacked. And so if we can ask the questions again, you know, not, you know, ending with you moron, um, <laughs> then that maybe can plant some seeds for later. Chances are we'll never convince someone in a single encounter. So my goal is to maybe put a stone in their shoe, but not preclude them finding out about it later from me or anyone else. Um, the, the issues of, um, maybe I'm wrong, so I'm subject to correction. I think that we've got three dietary strategies. We can be a uh, carnivore, no animal source food. We can be a vegan, no animal source food, right? Did, did I say that right? <laughs> no, I didn't. Carnivore, all, carnivore animal all animal source food. I was waiting to see if people were awake. Um, <laughs> so, okay, all animal, no animal, or an omnivore. And then you can dress that omnivore up and we've got 36 different flavors of that and I get it, okay, fine. If someone chooses not to eat red meat for some reason, as long as they're eating animal source food, good. If they're gonna to try to, okay, so there's degrees to this, and then if we want to explore what those reasons are, then there's information that we could explain. But I've got three keys in life. One is that public health will be harmed by further restrictions to access of animal source food. Number two, that livestock in general, ruminants in particular, are essential for sustainable food systems. Number three, these are our ancestral foods and our tradition, wherever those traditions and cultures emanate from. So the idea of going no animal source, that's a construct, uh, it's, it's a form of imperialism. <laughs> And so how you want to take that into a party, it's up to you. Thank you for the talks. This is a question for Dr. Ballasted. Uh, if you were the chief agronomist in a country like India, where the predominant dietary pattern is vegetarian, mostly because of religious ideology, where would you start? And then the secondary question for Dr. Eads would be, what's the anthropology behind the way people ate in India when they were, you know, their ancestors? What, what, what was that like? Because I'm curious to know. Yeah, so, um, so again, subject to correction, 95% um, of the world's vegetarians are economic vegetarians. They're not philosophical vegetarians. Um, so, we need to focus on how we can make whatever is appropriate animal source food available. My understanding is that even among people who aren't eating beef, they will eat mutton or goat, or they'll, they certainly eat a lot of dairy or poultry or fish. So these are animal source foods that are available. 
uh, and are being, so what can we do to make them more affordable? That's going to have things to do with logistics. And, you know, when you have 45% of humanity that consumes less than 1,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per person per year, that's a large North American refrigerator. 45% of humanity consumes less than that. We're talking about highly perishable foods. Um, so that, you know, cold chain transport, all those things come in. So I wish it were as simple as me packing up the, you know, Crop Science 301 Forages book and the, you know, Livestock book and sending it off. Um, but one of the really fascinating things for me is the work that's looking at reintegrating livestock into our cropping systems. And that'll be a conference I'll attend in Brazil next month. And I could talk about that later. Uh, as to the anthropological basis, I don't know. Uh, the pre-modern Indian anthropology, I'm just unfamiliar with. But if you go far enough back, you know, all those things apply that I showed on the slide. So somewhere along the way, they uh, got on this vegetarian track, and I, and I don't know the history of it. I wish I did, but I don't. Perhaps, Steve, there's a research project for you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Mine's a suggestion in response to a question a, a couple of times ago, and I find that uh, in speaking to people at parties, one of the things is not to talk too much about ingredients of food, but to talk about uh, sort of like a cultural perspective, and I use the Inuits, uh, you know, say, well, the Inuits had essentially a, a hugely saturated fat diet, seal and whale blubber, very little plant food, but no cardiovascular disease and no uh, diabetes. And that's where those Danish doctors went out and, cre you know, discovered the importance of omega-3s. And another group are the people like the Maasai, the nomadic pastoralists, who essentially their diet is meat, milk and blood. Uh, mainly milk uh, and its derivative products, dairy. Not to get into too much uh, sort of the biochemistry, but more into a cultural uh, yeah, explanation and, and to get them to think about other people other than Western society. And your question is? Well, do you agree? Question. It's a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was just a suggestion for these short party conversations to get people to think. So we have, a, we have a saying in the States about elevator pitches, right? If you found yourself in the elevator with the CEO of your company and you had a project and you had three or five fl floors of time to make that pitch, how would you do that? So forewarned, you know, forearmed is, you know, or forewarned, how does that go? Forewarned, yeah, yeah. So, you know, a little planning ahead of time. Um, so that, yeah, uh, that's what we get to do. Ancient Egyptians and uh, man boobs spring to mind. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Eads. You're welcome. Uh, this is a question for Dr. Eads. So we heard from Nicole yesterday about sort of opt optimal protein absorption per meal is about say 30 to 50 grams. Um, the assumption I'm making here is that our ancestors didn't have a constant bolus of protein with each meal. They'd hunt the animal, kill the animal, and then have that meal, and then may go days or you know, possibly some stretch of time without any sort of animal-based food or any food at all. So how does that sort of what we learned about protein absorption yesterday marry up with, I guess, human physiology in terms of protein absorption, given we didn't have a constant access to high-quality protein back when we were hunter-gatherers? So I, I, I'll just jump in. I think that it was about optimal protein synthesis, not absorption. And so we could absorb a lot more. We're not going to see a, 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 a response in muscle synthesis or protein synthesis above that, whatever, 30 to 40 some gram bolus. Um, but we'd still get the carbon skeletons, we'd still get the nutrients that come along with it. So I, I, that would be my beginning on that. Yeah, I, I didn't exactly understand your question. I have a, <laughs> I have a hearing deficit, so 
I didn't exactly hear your question. Um, how about I rewet? So back when we had, so back our ancient ancestors, when they hunted the animal and ate that meal, how much of that meal could they actually absorb oh. and use? Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, but, it, but I'm sure they got plenty of protein. And uh, because if you're, you know, chowing down on a mastodon, you got plenty there to eat. And I don't know, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> If you look at, I mean, one of the things that's, that's uh, really common in, in the anthropology literature are these papers that show the difference between uh, hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists. Because when man moved into agriculture, a lot of good things happened. You know, you were able to build cities. A few people were able to provide food for a lot of other people. So there was intellectual development. It gave people time to think and to, you know, develop accounting and all these other things that made ancient civilizations grow. But their health kind of went to hell in a handbasket. You know, bone cortical thickness went down, height went down, uh, uh, cavities went up, infectious diseases went up that you can see in the bones, these certain things that were kind of like yaws. Uh, and so overall, there was a, you know, there was a, a, a devolution in health when people moved into agriculture. So obviously before that, they were getting plenty of protein and they were getting what they needed. I mean, they were eating what they had evolved to eat. And so I suspect that they absorbed it just fine. Could be room for another research, a PhD project <laughs> for someone. Um, this might seem like an obscure question, but uh, as I'm sitting there listening to poor quality diets and availability and maldistribution of good quality diets and thinking about privilege, I was just thinking, what about the impact of war and displacement of populations? And I was just wondering, and I was just thinking, is this the one of the elephants in the room when we're talking about pushing to change the way we think about availability to food, uh, avail availability of food, and as activists? And I wonder whether you see yourselves as activists. Is there something you can do just by mentioning solving vi and problems with violence and how that integrates with our food? quality supplies. <laughs> well, let me just take it in a different direction. I think the influence of war has been in the background of a lot of our classic nutritional work that has become sort of the bed, you know, the, the, the standards and not acknowledged. So populations that were emerging from war-induced famine and disruption in their normal food supplies, uh, looking at you, Ansel Keys, um, <laughs> and, and not acknowledging that that was an issue. And then we saw similar things in um, Europe, um, you know, post-World War II, the Dutch had gone through a period of famine-induced, um, and they made a concerted effort to uh, prioritize dairy consumption and you know it's like walking through a redwood forest for me and I'm not that short um, you know the height increased we saw the same thing happen when the European trash came to America sorry um, <laughs> my ancestors um, and they tended to come from the lower populations right they weren't the landed that had access to animal source food People coming to this to colonial and early America were astounded by how much meat and game they were eating routinely through the day, and Americans became the tallest race for a while. Sorry, nationality for a while, and then you know we've been declining for several decades since. Um, you know, lack of access to resources is always a reason for war, and so you know. We have Europeans now who are saying, we're not gonna produce it here, but we'll bring it from somewhere else where they may not be as efficient, they may have a greater environmental impact, but we're, we're wealthy, we can afford it. Well, what's that gonna to do to the populations there? And so in that sense, we may be setting up some of these things as class struggles um, emerge as a result of these notions that are entertained in the high-income countries. 
I, I'm sorry, one more thing. I, I just came across a quote again that said, um, believe, belief that the number of cows in Ireland will affect the climate is like believing in the reality of lep leprechauns. <laughs> Thanks for your talks, they were really informative. The, the question I've got is about, um, well, I've been influenced by these blue zones around the world, you know, where people have lived, centurions have lived for, you know, for a long time without disease. And some of the studies showed that a lot of those people were, had traditionally plant-based diets. Uh, but then what I discovered was is that people in different parts of the world, you know, carnivores uh, equally lived equally as long or had less disease in their lives what's the what what's the experience or the research on the cultural uh, uh, benefits of eating for example like our ancestors so for example I've got European parents and so you know I tend to thrive on a Mediterranean diet so to speak so what's your experience on that on that thought uh, <clears throat> You, uh, you should get a video that's on YouTube by uh, Michael Rose, who's an evolutionary biologist, and he works with fruit flies. Now, you know, we're far removed from fruit flies, but what he's discovered with fruit flies, since they um, reproduce so rapidly, that he can get data from zillions of generations going back to what would be comparable to ancient times for us. And what he has discovered is that uh, if he feeds fruit flies on their, and he's got fruit flies that came over essentially on the Mayflower, and uh, that he's been breeding and feeds them the same as they fed them then, and then he started changing the diets around and screwing with all these parameters. And what he's discovered over is he's just now retired, so he's done this in his entire career. And he has found out that if you take, because he, the ant, fruit flies at ancestral diets too, and then they have modern diets. And what he's discovered with fruit flies is that uh, young fruit flies that uh, are living today uh, seem to do okay on a more modern diet that's a higher, uh, higher carb diet than the ancient fruit flies were used to. But when they get older, they do much better on an ancestral diet. And so there's something, somehow, fruit fly genes are whispering to them <laughs> as they get older, go back to the ancestral diet. <laughs> and I suspect that's probably true for humans as well. I, I, I think it would be fair to say that the blue zone data is really confounded uh, by a number of things that aren't always obvious. Um, you know, Okinawa is one area, for example, that's frequently cited, and yet they eat a lot of pork. Um, you know, the Mediterranean region was surveyed as part of the work that led to this. But if you do it during, you know, Orthodox Lent, their eating pattern might be different than the rest of the year. Um, you know, you, you have the influence of certain uh, belief communities um, and, and so some of these blue zones are areas where they co concentrate because of institutions. And now, of course, if a, if a municipality, at least in the U.S., wants to, they pay a certain amount to label themselves blue zones. So again, I think it's far more, it's far more confounded than has been um, presented. I think with the blue zone data, again, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to quote what Dr. Zoe Hakom has said. Don't just read what they're telling you. Try to find out what they're not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> right? So with every research paper or any study that shows, oh, this is the evidence we found, study the paper and see what they're not telling you because you will not get funding to pub publish something that the original funding was supposed to do. Check the title, check the abstract, check the paper. <laughs> they don't always agree. And on a final note, if you look at these societies like the Catavans, for example, who are famous for eating this high carb diet and having relatively decent longevity, I always think of my favorite philosopher economist, Frederick Bastiat, who said, you know, he looked at that which is seen and that which is not seen. And that which is seen in the Cantabans is that they live a, a pretty decent lifespan 
eating a high carb, non-processed diet, but what isn't seen is how long they would live if they ate meat. You don't know. That's that which is not seen. Blue zones are definitely a myth that deserves busting. Um, I think that's it. And so thank you to the panel for... <laughs>